When you joined the Communist Party in 1934, was that influenced at all by the activities of the black shirts in the East End? Yes, I would say at that particular time that was the main influence, though I already had close associates in the Communist Party. And uh, how active were the black shirts in, in the Stepney Whitechapel area in the 34-35? Well, I can't exactly say that they were more active there than in other places because I wasn't in a position to compare them. But they were getting more and more offensive almost week by week in that period. They were feeling their strength, and I suppose that much of what they were feeling was as a result of the advance of the Hitler regime. It's been suggested that there were some divisions within the Communist Party in London about how to tackle fascism and Mosley, and this came to a head when Mosley announced his plans to go through the East End on October the 4th. Some members of the Communist Party wanted to back the YCL rally in Trafalgar Square, Others wanted a they-shall-not-pass platform. What actually happened within the Communist Party? The real division was not so much the run-up to October the 4th. The real division was a matter of outlook and approach. There were those who felt that the fascists needed... that the attitude of the fascists should be one of complete hostility. There were others who felt that those among the fascists or their sympathisers, who were ordinary decent working folk, could be won over, and that therefore there had to be a very important effort to discriminate between the hard-line thugs of the fascists and the ordinary people who were attracted to their propaganda. I was among the latter. So you were against attacks on fascist meetings? No, it wasn't so much attacks on fascist meetings. At that particular time... We did not attack the fascist meetings as our main campaign. At that particular time, we were trying to develop our activity by canvassing, by talking with people, and typical of what we were doing was actually what happened um, several months later in Paragon Mansions, and that epitomises the difference in the attitudes. In that particular campaign, in, in that particular incident in Paragon Mansions, two families, uh, large families, were to be evicted. Both the men concerned were fascist supporters and the other people had very little association with them but were prepared to come to their assistance under the leadership which we gave and it was myself personally who was involved and that's on record in the press uh, to help them. And as we helped them, relatively, the the help which we gave was almost 90% successful. The result of that was that our members in that particular part of my land, Stepney, could then canvass the neighbouring streets, showing them what the Communist Party had done, and how we go about this, and how these two poor families, in arrears with their rent, got not any assistance from their own organisation, the BUF, and how our line was correct, Jews or Gentiles, whatever it may be. Now, that's the line which we were plugging. That's the line which we were already plugging in 1936. And therefore, politically, that was the main drift between us, the main difference between us. Now, so far... The the Communist Party was the main force, would you say, in the anti-fascist movement in the East End? From the point of view of everyday struggle, yes, the main force. The Labour Party did not at any time organise. In addition to the Communist Party, there was... I discovered this a little while ago, that's why I've got it here. I see. You've seen this? Yes, I have. Oh, well, it's, it's uh, October 30th. That's right, yes. In addition, there, was a local, there were local branches of the Independent Labour Party, which was then active, which is not known much about these days. And uh, they were also active, and very often we cooperated together. But the, uh, but the Communist Party was the main force. It's often imagined that the Communist Party in the East End in the 30s was almost exclusively Jewish. Is that true? No. No, it is not true. The same as it's not true that Stepney was Jewish. At one time, I tried, especially when I got onto the Borough Council, I tried to make some calculation with the help of official figures there as to the proportion of Jews in Stepney. The the population before the war was reckoned to be 200,000 in the whole of Stepney. And of them there were about 30,000 Jews in Stepney. Now, I imagine that the support which the Communist Party had 
was greater proportionately than that. And at one particular time in the 1937-38 period, we had some 18 street groups. And those in the, that a certain area of Mairen would have been mainly Jewish. Those in areas like Limehouse would have been mainly Gentile. We had a number of factory groups, so the Dockers group would have been completely Gentile. The group at Schneider's factory was about two-thirds Gentile, one-third Jewish. Coming on to the events of October the 4th, was the they shall not pass policy at all influenced by what was happening in Spain? Oh yes, oh yes. They shall not pass as a slogan was in fact the same as the Spanish Madrid people then had introduced in trying to stem the advance of the fascist, of the military fascists. And their slogan was non passeran, which in English is translated as they shall not pass. We adopted that slogan, and in fact, they, our friends and comrades who were already in Spain, though the International Brigade had not yet been formed, were already writing to us, and we, we, we knew what was going on. Yes, it was closely adopted. That. One of the points about the Communist Party, which has to be emphasised, as a favourable factor was that they saw themselves, as they do now, they saw themselves as part of a great international movement. Mosley, undoubtedly, saw himself as part of the great fascist international movement. We saw ourselves as part of a great anti-fascist movement. And therefore, it was clear enough how we identified ourselves with the struggle in Spain, not only of our own British comrades who went, but of course of the Spanish Republican people. How did you actually organise the uh, demonstrations in the East End on the 4th of October? How did you decide on where to gather and how did you spread the information around? Yes. Because it was all done at very short notice. Well, it was done with longer notice than a lot of people understood, and there's, there's been some misleading on this. In the first place, we knew about a month ahead that there was going to be an intended demonstration. What then happened was there was no intention of having any mass violent action of any kind. What then happened was that local authorities got together, local organisations. There had been established already an organisation called the Jewish People's Council Against Fascism. The Jewish ex-servicemen were active, a number of trade unionists who were on the left, like the furniture trade and others, they were active. And one res there were two results, for example, in the efforts made, normal legal efforts made, to get the government to ban the march. One was, there was a petition, and that was issued by the Jewish People's Council Against Fascism, but everyone worked on it, and they presented a 100,000 petition a uh, number petition to the Home Office and the Home Office turned it down. This was followed up by a visit of the five East London mayors uh, after that rejection and they were turned down. And it was only then that it was decided that in that case there has got to be a physical confrontation. Now, I want to make it perfectly clear that we in Stepney recognise that, obviously, but that, simultaneously, this was recognised at the District Committee of the Communist Party because the actual event of October the 4th could never have been organised by any local organisation. It was a London-wide effort, both for us and for members of the Labour Party and for Jewish people and whoever it was who was opposed to fascism. And what was your tactics? Where did you, you organise crowds for the 4th? Well, as we understood it, because it was openly announced by the fascists that the intention was to assemble at the Royal Mint Street, which is on the south corner near to the city of London, to march up, Cape, to march up Le Mans Street and then to march along Commercial Road. The purpose of that was to march eastward along Commercial Road because a mile and a half along in Salmon Lane they had one of their headquarters and there they intended to have a meeting. Next, from Salmon Lane they intended to have a further march along Pedette's Road and then into Bethnal Green and have a further meeting at Victoria Park Square in Bethnal Green. That was their intention. This was through largely Jewish areas? No, once they were past, once they came into Limehouse, they were outside the Jewish area. 
one mile of that, roughly speaking, would have been through the Jewish area of com or the part Jewish area of commercial roads. Uh, and that's what they were determined to do. Our intention, therefore, was to prevent them marching through the Jewish area. Now, the Jewish area at that particular point, from the point of a highway, is commercial road which goes due east from the city of London, from Oldgate, and Whitechapel Road which goes uh, east northeast from the from the same spot from Gardner's Corner. These two are very were and still remain very wide important roads, and Whitechapel Road in particular was a road at that time it still is about fifty yards I would say from building to building on the cross the road and so on. That's, we, we thought they would go there for us. If they couldn't go through the commercial road, they might try, might try to go through Whitechapel Road. And what we wanted to do was to block them, and this was our sole intention in the first place, to block them from travelling, from marching through areas occupied by Jewish people. We were not interfering with them at that stage about where, whatever else they wanted to do. Thus, the alternative for them was either to go north, at this junction, this well-known East London junction, and that meant along Commercial Street into Bethnal Green Shoreditch, at which point they are on the fringe of the Jewish area and right away into Bethnal Green Shoreditch, which was non-Jewish, or to turn south, or rather keep south, to the southern side of the borough, alongside the river, which is the highway or Cable Street. By going along there, a mile and a half further along, they can enter into the commercial road, but much outside the Jewish area. Is this clear? Mm -hmm. So how was it that the battle, so-called, actually took place along Cable Street rather than anywhere else? Well, that is not quite so. The final setback for the opposition, unfortunately, the opposition was not the fascists. The opposition, unfortunately, were the police. And we had, and I've often been asked this question, we had no animosity to the police. In those days, the police were really local police, and we knew them, and they were numbered. And we knew that many of them had the similar views like any other cross-section of the population. But it was necessary, so Sir Philip Game, the chief of police, thought, that the police should push their way through the crowds in order that the fascists can then march in peace. So it wasn't the fascists who were hurt, it was the police who were hurt, and so were outside. And what we were trying to do, therefore, was that it would have been, I'm now putting it precisely what our decisions were, it would have been a victory for us to have prevented the fascists marching either along Commercial Road or Whitechapel Road. We weren't very much concerned if they would then march up Commercial Street and into Bethnal Green. If they were to march through Cable Street, we felt that that would be a second victory if we could also prevent them marching through Cable Street. We therefore had that as our reserve. What we then did was this. Our instructions to all our members and all our branches, every branch secretary had instructions, and local Labour parties were linking up with Communist parties, as Bill Fishman admitted. Hackney was linking up with the Communist Party and each branch secretary had an idea roughly of where his group and supporters were to stand at Gardner's Corner, as it was known. And the pictures show what it looked like. So we had that. Now we directed several branches and groups, including our dockers, to Cable Street. In fact, the leader of the operation in Cable Street, where, where there was the cock-up with the lorry I've mentioned, was a chap called Ron Sell, who was the leader of East Ham. And he was not a doctor, he was an electrician. Nice guy. And their instructions were to create three barricades. Firstly one, which had to be created, and secondly the emergency one, which was the lorry, which had to be turned over. And then there was a third area, which we also had ready, which we never put into use. Of course, it was by the time of the second one, that's this one here. No, I think it, it, this one is only partly shown. Yeah. No. Now, that was the first one. Then 150 yards here, 
That's why you see, that's, we're looking west. 150 yards here was where the lorry was. And that was the lorry that was hijacked by mistake. Yeah. They got the wrong lorry. And I had to settle <laughs> could, that could, one. could you tell the story of that? Because <laughs> it's, it's such a good story. Well, you see, among the things which happened there, which one has got to see the scene, where, on an occasion like this, you are really getting thousands and thousands of non-political people who support you. And in fact, if I may interject at this point, in connection with something which is going on right now in that same vicinity, the whopping events with Mr Murdoch, and the local people who are ordinary decent people who are now complaining that they are becoming the victims of this whole scene in this same area almost of 50 years ago. And at that time, all kinds of people supported us, the kind of people who keep away from politics, like, for example, publicans. And so one of, my, one of our colleagues was able to arrange with a man who had a kind of yard in Cable Street, and he had a lie which he said we can use, he didn't want it, it's an old one, and so on. And uh, in fact it didn't go, it had to be manoeuvred by hand. And that was the one which had to be pulled out, it wasn't in the road at the time, it had to be pulled out into the road. And, uh, and that arrangement was conveyed to my very good friend Ronnie Sell. In the event, when they shouted, get the lorry, uh, some of the people looked around and all they could see was a hundred yards or so further back, a lorry stationary in the road. Somehow they got that lorry, dragged it along, I don't know anything at all about ignition, they dragged that along and that's the one they turned over. And so that became the barricade of the wrong lorry. And... Uh, I had two complaints subsequently, one from the man who wanted us to get rid of his lorry, and one from the man who discovered his lorry had now been more or less destroyed. But we sorted them out. Did you give him compensation or what? Well, we reached an agreement. <laughs> we, we, there was, there was, after, the, after that victory, and it was a victory, it, it was a battle, and it was a victory, after that victory we, we had a very good relationship with many, many people. Because what was seen, and it wasn't that East London people were necessarily uh, violent for violence sake, like one sees in Belfast this very week and so on, but what really happened was that they did not want trouble in their borough. And it was quite obvious that these outsiders in their black shirts were coming to make trouble. And the fact that their trouble was directed, their offense, offensiveness, against the Jewish section of the population, the fact is that many others realised that they were also involved because it was their borough, it was their town. And so all kinds of people supported So in the event, this particular man who had that lorry decided to let it go uh, and uh, to try and claim, no doubt, insurance. But I never heard the result of that. But it came my way because I was responsible for clearing up problems. And did the Communist Party recruit many people as, re as a result of the Street? I think we did. I think, but firstly, not only in Stepney, but I think that subsequently there was a greater regard for the Communist Party because it was in such contrast. You see, it took place in October, and as you know, at a, in October, it's now been an arrangement for many years, both the Labour Party conference takes place and the Trade Union Congress take place in the same period. And therefore, the attitude of the Communist Party, both to this and to the events in Spain, which were taking place at the same time, showed the kind of leadership which I think many people were looking for. Notably, the answer to that question would be, younger people joined. The kind of people who, uh, three years later, would have been called up to join the forces, we're now joining the Communist Party because they felt that they ought to uh, have a go. And do you think that Cable Street effectively meant that Mosley was on the way out in the East End? Well, I'll tell you what I think about this because it's been posed many times. Uh, I'll give you an example. It might be of interest to you. Martin Walker. Now, he's showing himself a very capable journalist in The Guardian. He's doing some very good reports right now in the Soviet Union. Now, he wrote in a book... I think it was, some years ago, or in an article. And I, I wrote a letter to, con to criticise that uh, it had not stopped the advance of the fascists and it was proved in 1937 at the local government elections. 
Now, let me explain where he made a blunder in his understanding. <coughs> the fascists put up candidates in a number of wards in Stepney, Bethnal Green and Shoreditch in 1934. The elections were held every three years. Therefore, they also, and they won no seats at all. They also put up candidates in 1937 in similar wards, and they won no seats at all. But their vote went up. From that, Walker drew the conclusion that therefore they had advanced. What Walker did not understand was that if you take a graph, 1934, 1936 like this, 1937 like that, i.e. 37 was better than 34, but had there been elections in 36 before October, they could well have won several seats. By 1934, they were on the way down. He forgot that graph. And we claim that 1936 was the watershed. That's my argument against Walker. Did you ever see Oswald Mosley? Oh, yes. We, we see him. To talk to him, though. No. I saw him on the platform and on the and marching, yes, of course. What was he like? What, what sort of aura did he give? Well, you see, firstly, he was playing a part. He'd been an ex-MP. I mean, he, was, he had been a member of Parliament. He'd been a Cabinet Minister. Uh, so, so he was a member of Parliament. So I was a member of Parliament. And the air he gave himself had nothing to do with being a member of Parliament. It was partly because I never saw him except in uniform. And therefore you weren't seeing Mosley. You were seeing a black shirt, large black boots, sharply hung cap, uh, with his shoulders stuck out as one does when one's marching. And inside there's the man. You saw the uniform. Next, I never saw him alone. That is, one saw him surrounded by a gang of thugs, who, by the way, were paid 12 and 6 a time. Uh, how do I explain 12 and 6? 12 and 6 was um, 62p. Uh, I sh shall I explain that? No, it's okay. In those days, lots of working-class chaps were keen on boxing. And if they were any good, uh, then they would be selected by some manager for going professional. If they did go professional, they would box a few rounds at some local place. There was a place in East London called the Premier Land. And the price for that was 12 and 6 a night. So a man would box 10 rounds and get 12 shillings and 6 pence, 62p. Mostly offered them the same money when he had a meeting to attend, they would attend, they would be in uniform, they would have their knuckle dusters, and they got 12 and 6 pence, 62p. Now, in all fairness, in their demonstrations, these thugs only were a fraction of the crowds they were able to gather. The great majority were ordinary people dressed in a normal way, etc. But those were the thugs. On the day of the Battle of Cable Street, did you see any fascists? Yes, of course. I was down at Gardner's Corner two or three times. I was going around on the pillion of a motorbike. And I, that's when I went, as I said, I went down to a back street, there's a place called Backchurch Lane, into Cable Street, and had final words with Ronnie Sell when we already began to get the information from our intelligence section. And we saw that the mounted police were now moving away from the crowds in Gardner's Corner. The attack was ending, and we sensed, and we, well, in any case, the telephone calls were coming through, that they are likely now to go down Cable Street. And I, on the back of this thing, went down, saw any cell, and saw everything was all right, uh, and uh, the lorry was clear, and that was that. So I was around there. At that time, my young sister-in-law, who was then a nice girl of about 18, she had her back hurt, when she was pushed through Gardner's Corner. Gardner's was a big store, a men's store. And she was pushed through the plate glass window when it broke. And actually, I was near it at the time when it happened, but I didn't know she was involved. I only discovered it later. Oh, yeah, I was there. Where did you get your intelligence from? Did you have any inside information? Well, we didn't have any inside information from the fascists. We had, in we had inside information from people whom we placed there. And this is another indication of the way in which we worked, and when I say we, uh, sometimes I mean the whole of the people who were there, and I was just one of a hundred thousand or whatever the figure was. In this particular instance, what I mean by we is the Communist Party, and particularly the London Communist Party. 
The sun. This is also in this is entrepreneur. In answer to Jacobs, the Sunday morning before October the fourth, that would be September twenty sixth. I myself spoke to a meeting in Hoban, which was convened by someone from the London district, not by me, of selected middle class members of the Communist Party, and there were about twenty people, men and women, and I spoke to them. Explaining what their duties would be behind the lines, that they should mingle with other people who were coming ostensibly to support the fascists, because there were many numbers of people there on their side coming from the city end into Royal Mint Street. If one looks at the map, you can see. And therefore, they should mingle. And we had two lines laid on, and they should make their te- telephone calls. And this information would be very useful to us. Try and find out what's going on. If they felt it was a rumor, they should just ignore it. The big, uh, the big, the the the, the 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 thing which was very very valuable to us was that one of these people was a senior student at London Hospital, named Faulkner, as a doctor, and he himself was in the London Hospital Socialist Society. But he knew a number of the fascists there who had already been called out to give a hand on the. Ambulance section on their medical aid section, and he offered them, on a humanitarian basis, to help them, and he managed to persuade them that he was there for that particular reason. He it was the one mainly who gave us information as to what was happening, and we found it quite reliable, and it worked. Among the other things which we did, we had a very good organisation on medical aid. Because we wanted to help our people rather than send them to hospital. And how many people were arrested? The figure which we had at one time was 150 who came up in court. I think about 150. How many of them communists? I can't answer. I don't know. I know that several cases came my way. There was one case of a, a man who was sent to prison, and.、Uh, He sent me a message. He was he was not a member of the Communist Party, to his wife, and we set up a fund to help them. I remember that case, but I can't say how many were communists. One final question: Do you think that if it were not for the Battle of Cable Street and the reputation it、uh, gave to the Communist Party of being for the people of the East End, that you would have been elected in Mile End in forty five? Ah, you're going on to forty five. Well, that, that was a number of things. Well, the first point is to take it chronologically.、Uh, without a doubt, the 1936 events against the fascists stimulated a lot of political thinking among people and arguments. And we sense that by what happened at our meetings. We used to have many in those days. We used to have many public open air meetings. This has now declined. Because of the advance of technology and so on, and we saw it. But the kind of questions we asked, very simply, whereas often in those meetings the questions would have been oppositional, if not even hostile.、Uh, many of these questions were now requiring information, and that means that the people had jumped over from being apolitically or hostile to becoming. Politically interested. Now that happened early on, and so the first recorded advance, so to speak, was the election result in 1937, where I won a seat. It was a solid Labour area, and I won a seat, which means one of the Labour people was defeated. This is Stepney Council. It's Stepney Council, and we had increased the votes. I got 616 votes. In 1934, another chap got 98 votes, so we increased it by 600 percent, which is a fair increase, and and we got that. Now this was also the first seat ever in London. It was the first councillor ever in the whole of the south of England, and we got that. Therefore, there must be some connection with it. But here, I must move sideways. This was also the time when we had introduced and were conducting a powerful campaign on the. For the tenants, both the conditions and the rents and things of that kind, and we had set up that we had set up the Stepney Tenants Defence League, 
which then became a broad organisation with Father John Grocer as the president and so on. And therefore, all this was in 37, 38, 39, then came the war, of course. And I would say that by 1945, there must have been a number of things which came together in Stepney. Uh, it's very difficult to explain because of the, of the many people who had been evacuated from Stepney and left Stepney who had been bombed out. But I think that it was the victory, the, the war victory. What happened in Stepney, really, was, in a way, one step leftwards of what was happening in the country. No one expected the Labour government to have an overwhelming majority. In fact, many of them were doubtful whether they'd win against Churchill. But there was a most powerful Labour representation of 380 members, and many areas which previously had been conservative had swung Labour. What then happened in Milan and Stepney, and in places like Hackney, where there was a 21% vote for the Communist Party, was a swing further left than Labour. Does it? Yeah. That's lovely.